Welcome to Do You Ever Wonder? The show that brings you answers to many of the questions that you may have, but with no one to ask. Do You Ever Wonder is hosted by Mike Holtman, CEO of Hallmark Abstract Service, who, like you, has always been deeply curious about a wide variety of topics. Each week, Mike will be speaking with guests who are leaders in their field and who have inspirational stories to tell. So now, sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Mike Altman. Pleasure to be back. Uh, we are here with somebody who was, I'm going to call him a child prodigy only because he's a lot younger than I am. <laughs> but um, I read some work that he did and I was fascinated and I reached out and he graciously agreed to come on. His name is Dylan Jovine. I hope I pronounced that right. Jovine. You're not the only one to get it wrong. It's okay. Jovine. Okay. Yep. So he is the founder of uh, a, a website called behind the market and behind the market has a a tagline you want me to say it or, or you want to say you can it? say it all right it's bringing institutional opportunity to individual investors and that's a uh you know that's a that's a phenomenal mantra because uh i cut my teeth on wall street i was a bond analyst i was a bond trader at some of the biggest firms that no longer exist and i know that and then i was an equity trader so I do know, and that was at a time when I, you're on a trading desk, you have to call the floor, you have to uh -huh. deal with market, whatever. But uh, uh, yeah. the institutional investors on Wall Street have a huge leg up. You know, they, you know, the glass wall between it, between research and uh, traders is a theory that sounds great, but doesn't really exist. And uh, you know, the the fact that it, all knowledge, all information is uh, available to everyone, I think, is also a fallacy. So welcome, Dylan. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Um, uh, I, a really great opportunity to talk. I didn't know you were a trader. When when, when, uh, when were you an equity trader? Uh, I was an equity trader in the mid 80s. I started with a guy who started a firm called Schoenfeld Securities. I don't know. I've heard of Schoenfeld, that. sure. Yes, he. Um, I remember in the early days, we drove around in his convertible, we would go into the city, we would sit with other traders. Mm. And uh, he created, I mean, he had at some point, we were all uh, trading other people's money for a split of the profits. He had over a 1000 traders. I mean, it was yeah, just built quite an operation. And now, he's, now he's got 100 acres in Old Westbury. I, I, I think mm. being from Queens, you might be familiar. Yeah, and he yeah. Uh, built his own golf course. So I, I think he did pretty well. God bless him. I should God have bless him. Back his trades. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know the 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 tagline institutional research for individual investors. It we kind of outgrew that. That has to be a change. We've been changing it in other places. We've been going through this process because what I found out, what I learned um, when I when I started doing this, I started doing this in two thousand and three, selling research for individual investors online. Um, I started doing this in 03 and what we, that was our tagline at the time. And what I found out is that, uh, you know, people are like, I don't want institutional research. We don't, I don't want to read because I would sit there and write all these book. I, I'd write a, this crazy report where I would analyze. I do discounted cash flow analysis. I'd analyze the entire value chain, the supply chain, the distribution chain. We do the SWOT analysis. <laughs> and they just want to know what stock's going to go yeah, up. Yeah, they, and they want to know that you're reasoning out, that you have decent reasons, good rationale, and that you understand both the risks and the potential rewards. Like, well, you know, what are the risks here? And so I, I would sell this and I look, look at me, look how smart I am. I'm going to show you institutional research. And I'd send these 150 page reports and I was so proud of them. And, and you know, it was crickets. And this guy who worked at the uh, at, at fool.com at the time, actually, he worked at the street. He sold his company in the street and he had worked with the fool, too. Mom, he said, fool? yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. He said to me, nobody wants research. They want stock recommendations. Nobody. You, you think you're so fancy. You think you're so smart, but you're only writing for yourself because the consumer that we're interacting with, they're not studying the business in the case, the SWOT analysis. They just want to know what to buy and why. You know what I mean? So we've started. So I changed that tagline when we got acquired by Agora. And more recently, we're going through, we're rebranding and remarketing kind of our stuff. And we've just settled on uh, independent research for independent investors. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Short, nice sweet, and simple. short, sweet. And, and it is what we do. 
Well, and so we do it pretty equity, well. When I, I'll bet you do. So when I, when I was an equity trader, we had CNBC on all the time. And this yeah. was during the, the tech bubble. And they would bring these guys on, these research analysts, and they would give you reasons why a stock with no earnings and really no future, they were upgrading it. And, you know, and it, and it, it would, you know, some people might look at Wall Street and say it's really a Ponzi scheme. In some uh, respect. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, you know what I've learned? I, I So I, when I was young on Wall Street, um, you know, I lost everything. I lost all my money. I didn't understand how to play the game. I was just one of these guys following squiggly lines. You know, if it breaks out, it's a cup and handle. If it's a triple top, you know, and all this stuff. And I, I pretty, analysis. yeah, pr pr te simple technical analysis, very primitive. And I lost all my money and it wasn't long. And, you know, I started studying Warren Buffett. And, you know, I really, I really spent, you know, 25 years, like I, I started, I remember losing everything and saying, you know, who's thought about this at the highest level, you know, and, and that led me to Buffett. And I started reading all his shareholder letters. I started, you know, and, and I urge anybody watching this, go to the Berkshire Hathaway website, he started 1977, they go all the way back. You can actually read and what you're reading is a guy who's not famous. He's just an investor who buys this, this mill and he's talking about how he's thinking about his business, like operating income and as a, relative to, to your balance sheet uh, capital and all these other things. So he's really breaking down how to look at a business when no one's watching. And it taught me so much because my mother was an accountant. So I had an instinctive understanding and, and some history looking at financials. So that when I started to really look at stocks as businesses, as, you know, pieces of a business that took my anxiety down completely. And it really made me start saying, you know, I don't really care what the market's doing. I do. And I don't not really uh, on a day to day basis. I don't even think about it, frankly. But I, I, you know, do I understand the business? Am I comfortable with management? What is the business worth? And then what do I have to pay for it? Those are the four questions I need to answer. And I have found that by 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 doing that, by using these tools that I learned from Buffett, that I am right. I have a good batting average and we above average returns. Now, do you um, do you buy and sell or do you buy and hold? Do you trade in and out? Well, I buy, I mean, my ideal holding time is forever, frankly. I, I'd rather not sell anything, really, because I don't want It's just moving up over time. You know, for example, last year when it crashed below 100 and now it's whatever it's at, why would I ever sell that? As long as they keep investing their capital in their business at an above average rate, they earn high returns on capital and it, whatever excess capital they can't invest at a high rate, they're buying back stock and paying dividends. I will hold this forever. It's interesting. I recently had a guest who is a behavioral financier who, you know, works with people's emotions because mm. the typical individual investor will sell the low, will right. buy the high, you know, will say I'll get back in and then never does. And, you know, this guy's thesis is, you know, stocks go up, they, they're volatile, but they go up, dividends grow. And, you know, he, his argument is all against bonds because bonds, you're not, you're not growing your purchasing power. You're not keeping your purchasing power up with the market. With yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be for, it depends on your age and your risk tolerance. You know, bonds are, I mean, I certainly, you know, I, I mean, for me, I keep uh, excess cash in uh, short-term money market, uh, you know, short-term U.S. treasuries. I wouldn't go over a year, that's for sure. Because, uh, you know, you're getting high yields at the low end of the curve. You're getting Absolutely. killed. You know, the Fed is suppressing yields at the high end of the curve. It's a total manipulation. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a whole, that's a whole other... That's another yeah. whole ball of wax. That's you a whole know, other ball of wax. So, I wrote an article, know, well, yeah. I, I just uh, I wrote an article years ago about why interest rates can't rise. And back then, the federal deficit was whatever it was. Now we're what thirty four trillion. I mean, it's you know, it's shocking. We're not far off from uh, you know, if interest rates rise to become normalized, which I, I guess they may be. They're really not getting any very close. But you know, what happens? I mean, you know, we we actually uh, spent a trillion dollars for the first time ever in interest this year, and we've been borrowing about a trillion dollars every 100 days. So, it's, you know, people don't re it's crazy. It's people staggering. don't realize it's staggering. You know, it's it's unsustainable, too. Um, you know, and, and it really that comes a lot from 
you know, this this new theory that took hold uh, in the late 90s and 2000s, modern monetary theory, you know, the, you know, came from the left. Now, both parties have adopted it, but it started on the left, um, you know, with, uh, you know, I won't say her name in public, but she was Bernie Sanders chief advisor and uh, head of the Senate Finance Committee. So, you know, they modern monetary theory, they, they believe that debt doesn't matter as long as you're using that money to repay student loans and universal basic income and all these other things. And, you know, they've been right for a while because we've had the capacity on the balance sheet or asset side to add debt, but everybody's right until they're not, you know. It's funny. I mean, it's the same thing in real estate. A builder who you lend money to is a great builder, a great guy, until he's not. Until right. the market turns and then you're up shit's creek. That's right. And it, the market always turns, as you know, and as I know. The market does always turn. So the the piece that um, that I found interesting, which is why I reached out to you, had to do with war games. The 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 prospect that, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to where we are, you know, whether it's our economy, whether it's our competition with China, but I've always been fascinated with uh, U.S. defense policy and foreign affairs and national security. And, you know, in, in relation to one of the aspects of business you were talking about in that article was, was simply hypersonics yeah. and how far the U.S. is behind the curve, how far. So I don't know if you want to talk about uh you know, our, our national defense in terms of politics, or if you want to talk about it in terms of investing, and I'm happy to do either one. Well, I'll tell you, um, I'll talk about it in terms of policy. You know, okay. um, you know, I've studied great power. I'm an ancient historian. I've studied ancient Greece, ancient Rome. I've studied history for, for many years, and I've always been fascinated by the decline and fall of empires and, and countries. You know, what, what actually leads this to happen? I'm always... I was always asking myself, do the people who are living it know this is happening? Do they know they were in decline? You know, how did how did that happen? And, you know, what I've learned is that, you know, uh, I read in, you know, 30 years ago, a book by uh, Thucydides, you know, called the Peloponnesian War. And he talks about the, the, the war between Athens and Sparta. And basically, he postulates a theory which is now known as the Thucydides trap, which is that a rising power will always challenge an established power. Uh, it is the nature of things like a lion, like a young lion trying to take over a pride. Uh, you know, he tries to beat up the older lion and the older lion could deal with him if he's strong enough. But if not, the younger lion kills him and takes over the pride. Such is nature, you know, is it yeah. strong enough or is it also willing enough? Both, both. I mean, I, you're right. Strength, willingness, focus, drive, uh, sacrifice, willing to make sacrifices. And, um, you know, I look at China and by the way, throughout history, I, I spent 30 years thinking about this and looking at this. And I've not found one case where the rising power didn't try to topple the established power. There's only one time in history that the, the that was done peacefully when a new power, the rising power, took the reins from the established power. And that was when we took the reins from Britain after World War Two, because they had basically gotten their butts kicked, no matter how, whether they won the war or not. So it's the only time there's been a peaceful transfer of power from uh, rising power, established power to rising power. Only time. You think of 1914 Germany going after England. You think of France going after England. You think of Mongols going after China. You think of, uh, you know, I mean, name the place on the map. This is the nature of things. Um, you know, so uh, anyway, so when Xi Jinping took power, you know, he's a nationalist all the way, you know, so I was really kind of concerned and he pulled out like the dictator playbook. If you look at what he did, he the first thing he does is he starts at moral laws, you know, right out of Julius Caesar, right out of Augustus Caesar's playbook. So he eliminates all of his enemies on moral laws. You're not you know, you have two why you're you're seeing a girl on the side or you've taken graft. Now, they've all done this, but he just eliminates the ones that are threats to him. Right. Yes consolidates his power. Then he starts ramping up spending and military. And, uh, you know, he says, we want to be the preeminent power by 2025. Right. He says it. He says it. It's God bless him. Not a it's secret. no secret. <laughs> and look, our, our establishment, both Democrats and Republicans, they have this delusional theory that if you bring China into the WTO, if you make them rich, They'll become our little buddies. 
you know, meanwhile, fast forward, we've created Frankenstein's monster. You know what? Stupid people. Well, you know, the Peter principle. No, really interesting. It's uh, where people rise to their highest level of incompetence. So <laughs> somebody will be promoted until and, you know, it seems that if you look at the upper echelons of our power structure, the Peter principle is well. In, oh, yeah. Uh, well in hmm. control. And uh, it's. You know, I, I I have a bias politically one way, but it's it's frightening. That it's frightening. It, it's frightening. And I'll tell you, Trump was the first guy for all of his faults. He was the first guy in national politics to actually come out and say, you idiots, you don't know what you're doing with these people. They want to come after us. He was the first guy to really. And again, like him, hate him, whatever it is, because he's right on a lot of things, wrong on a lot of things. But on that issue, he was right down the middle of the plate, fastball right. Smoke right down the middle of the plate. He was right. And he he did things that helped bring us back to a position of some level of power. 100%. We, yeah. We are, now, we are now weak and feckless and a target. But I'll tell you one thing that Trump did that both parties have adopted, okay? Both parties. So he, I remember when he was negotiating the tariffs with China, I remember Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi tweeting, we support you, Donald, you know, just on this one thing. Because one thing, on this one thing, yeah, yeah. well, the, on China, they were letting the Chinese know that when it comes to that, they're bipartisan. So I think that Trump really changed that one thing in Washington, where it's actually now unified bipartisan approach to China. And Biden, for, for all his weakness, uh, I give him great credit for actually following on Trump's policies, basically inheriting the Trump policies and ratcheting some of them up when appropriate, like, uh, you know, without a doubt, you know, but Trump was freaking right on NATO. He was right on China. He was right, obviously, on the border. We have we had 10 million people walk across the border without audit. Never seen anything like it. Listen, I'm going into New York City today, and I'm going to be getting out near the Roosevelt Hotel, which is ground zero for the migrants. If uh, somebody gets into office in November, the border will be wide open. Migrants will be flowing in. And my prediction is that city after city around the country are going to be bankrupted. Yeah. And that will... I guess maybe serve the purpose of making the federal government have to take control. But oh god, that would suck. You, you know, tell me that Greg Abbott and DeSantis aren't geniuses for shipping the migrants right up to New York. You want a sanctuary city? Here you go. Listen, <laughs> Mayor Adams, who's got he's dealing with his own uh, corruption sure. problems. Sure. Right now. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if, Listen, it's like um, Mike Tyson said, not to quote anybody, but, you know, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. It's great to be a sanctuary city until you yeah. have to start yeah. dealing yeah. with the ramifications. And yeah. I mean, listen, I, I, I'm the board chair of a combat veteran charity. And we, are you a veteran? I'm not. OK, but you're the chair of a charity for veterans. Correct. You know, when we get off this, if you could email me uh, some information on that, I'd look into that. Sure. You know, I'm a big, you know, no, that's no, no, no. military is military and kids. Those are things that are close to my heart for charity wise. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is that that one uh, percent of Americans serve. And my charity deals with vets who come home suffering moral injury, which is an invisible wound. Sure. And, you know, invisible wounds don't get the same attention that a visible wound gets, obviously. But uh, mm. what's my point? I had Did you, <laughs> did you come up with that term, invisible wounds, yourself? No, no. That's I, a great term. Wow. It really is. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Hmm. You know, these, uh, you know, death by suicide, 22 yeah. plus a day. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's horrific. But yeah. um, my Paul, oh, my point was all of this money going to migrants who don't really seem to be appreciative anyway, but, you know, food stamps or, or debit cards and, and free housing oh, it's, and it's free crazy, food crazy, and crazy. free. It's crazy. It's crazy. Don't get that same treatment. 
it's you know? it's it's offensive and you know the funny thing is remember when trump was president and there were a, like a boat coming in from haiti and he uh, said uh we don't want anybody from the shithole countries even my liberal friends were kind of laughing about that because um you know because uh, I have friends on both sides. And, you know, I, as an investor, one of the things, and you know this, you worked on Wall Street, you can't, like, when it comes to your political, your investment operations, you've got to be ruthlessly objective. Like, you got to you got to focus on policy. Sometimes this, this, this party has the right policy for job growth and expansion and national defense. Sometimes it's the other guys. Like, you know, I, I'm very fluid that way. But look, I, I say to my friends all the time, Trump, I agreed with 70% of his policies. Bottom line. Uh, listen, I... I was never a Trump guy. I am a Republican, but if he adjusted a little bit the way he, yeah, but he never will. But nah, he's Trump. He's a New York bullshitter, just like we know. We we grew up with people like this all the time. Like to 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 people in the rest of the country, he's shocking. Oh my God, you hear what he said? If you grew up where I grew up in Queens, a stone's throw away from it, we're on the stoop all the time, just ripping on each other. That's the way we grew up. He's a just, yeah, just a New York bullshitter, it's you know? It is, but uh, yeah, so, you know, most of what he wanted to do, listen, a, a strong border, there's got to be deeper yeah. ramifications, diff, diff, deeper rationale for wanting an open border. And maybe it's to import voters, but while you're importing voters, you're importing terrorists, you're importing criminals, and gangs, drug dealers, so, yeah. Yeah, that surprises me. The open border, 10 million people walking across without audit. That's unacceptable. You know, we have we have, you know, more foreign born people in this population, 50 million than any time in history. 50 million. OK, have we had time to teach them what it means to be American, what the Constitution is, what the Declaration of Independence is, why we pledge allegiance? We grew up pledging allegiance to the flag and really getting taught this. You have to know that. But you know what the thing is? A lot of these people coming over the border don't want to learn. They don't they want do to not want to learn. I agree. And the schools, the the crisis facing the schools when you're bringing in people of unknown education. Who oh, yeah, I agree. It's, English. I mean, it's a disaster. Anyway. Yeah, it's a disaster. Um, the thing, you know, the other thing you spoke about the military earlier, we have the biggest population in our country's history and the military is having trouble meeting recruitment numbers. And why is that? Because same thing with police. Why is that? Because when you're vilified, when yeah. you're treated mm. like crap, you know, mm. why, why would you want to join? Mm. Uh, were you, you know, down like, there? Were you down there on 9-11? I was not. But the guy sitting next to me, his son died. Ah, uh, yeah. He's sitting next I, to you right now? Not now. Oh, but, but, oh you mean in general. Oh, man, yeah, I'm so but sorry. I, I had worked on the 107th floor. Mm. And so I was I was I was at the New York Stock Exchange that morning and I was one of those people running away. And I famously, among my friends, took a picture. I walked into the store on Wall Street uh, after the second you know, uh, plane hit and I, I bought an instant camera and I took a picture. Last picture I took is big smoke cloud coming, people running towards me. And I snapped and I started running down the street and headed towards uh, the East River. Anyway, I bring this up because I remember right after that, uh, you know, Palestinians dancing in the street. Right. I remember people in Jersey dancing in the street, the Muslims are there. And I think, and I was watching these protests last uh, summer and that are happening right now at those college campuses. And I'm like, what the F happened? And you know what? Oh, you know what happened? I'll tell you what happened. What happened? Anti-Sem Anti-Semitism was always slightly below the surface. Always. Now, yeah. now it's become uh, allowable. Now it's become yeah. part of our society. If you... Yeah. Listen, if you go out and say something about a Jew or punch a Jew in the face, you're not going to get in trouble. But, Agreed. you know, the reverse is if if an African-American is walking down the street. I forget. Oh, criminal. Tie him up. Jews. Put an electric chair for him. So, and you know what? I'm Jewish. My mother's Jewish. I'm not a religious person. My mom's Jewish. My father was Catholic, you know, really Italian, Catholic, Spanish, you know, like really old school. They're European mutts, basically. But my mother's a Russian Hungarian Jew. And, you know, I don't practice the faith. I'm not an observant. I don't really understand that. I never really felt connected to it. But I will tell you this. If Hitler won the fucking war, I'd be dead. A hundred percent. And I and a hundred percent. I'm that Jewish, meaning that if Hitler won the war, I'd be dead. I wouldn't be here. And my kids, I look at my kids and I'm like. You're going to grow up. You're growing up in a world with real anti-Semitism. 
you know, it, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. I li so I live in a neighborhood with, with upper middle to wealthy Jews. And they don't, it's no different than I think sanctuary cities. Nobody gives a shit no, until it impacts you. Right. When, when the gangs of skinheads are walking down Jericho Turnpike in Woodbury, yeah. the Jews will say, you know what, I, I, I akin it to the 30s in Germany. Jews were just acquiescent. Listen, I, it sucks that they're making us do this, but you know it, it's not going to go any further. Uh, and by the time you realize that it it's a problem, it's too late. And that's yeah. yeah. Listen, uh, they're moving you out of your house. By the time you realize it's real, they're at the door banging you, saying you're moving into the ghetto down the block. A hundred percent. And uh, listen, I'm a again, I'm a big believer in. Uh, in national security, in home security, in family security, yeah, and you know, uh, it's it's a minority position in a in a great many ways in the Jewish community, and I don't know what it was like in Germany in the 30s, but it must have been very similar. Well, you know, it's funny. I listened to Stern for a lot of years. Remember Howard Stern, and he, you know, he he said something that really always struck me. This is back in the 90s. He said, uh, I'm a big believer in Second Amendment rights." This is Howard Stern says pretty much as liberal as they get. But one thing he said is, I'm a big believer in the right to get, carry arms. He's like, because I'm Jewish. I know 50 years ago, 60 years ago, what happened to the Jews in Germany that didn't have guns to defend themselves. So I don't know how any Jew could not believe in, a, think of a government turning against them. How do you not have a gun if you're Jewish? Sadly, it happened to gun, Jews with guns too, but- That's true, but at least you you don't go down on your knees. Right. I at least you, don't, you go out fighting. I have a shotgun. I'm probably one of the few people in my neighborhood who does. I was recently in Florida. Uh, I stayed at Woodfield and the guy we were staying with, you know, we played golf and then we went to a gun range. And mm -hmm. I think more and more liberals are, are catching on. And, you know, the shotgun, most people don't know this. Whenever anybody asks me advice about home defense, I say, get a shotgun. Without a doubt. Good. You don't have to aim. You just got to you got to point in the general direction, and it yeah. is the most effective home defense tool out there, period. 100%. And you might not even have to use it because the ch -ch That's right. It's pretty it's a, pretty powerful dissuader. Absolutely. <laughs> but no, it's, it's interesting. You know, so we did get a little bit into uh, national security and uh, politics a little bit, which is great. But tell me a little bit about your investing thesis. You look for... Now, early in your career, you picked a lot of takeover targets, which that's right. Yeah, is how you, that's how you made your name. That is that's true. That's how I made my name. No, I mean, that is a uh, you know, I so I w during Wall Street, you'll remember this in the 90s. Remember, uh, there was banks and mergers. There was basically massive consolidation happening in the telecommunications industry sure. and the banking industry. And what I started to perceive was, well, I, I mean, I don't know why I just started looking at banks and I, you know, like saying, okay, JP Morgan CEO says that they're going to expand into Michigan. So I would just, okay, let me see what banks are in Michigan that have the kind of things that they're looking for and that are trying to achieve. And I recommend Michigan national bank. But, and it was taken over. And I had like, like five or six takeovers in a short period of time. And my trader who worked on the trading desk, I will not say his name in public, tipped me off to the SEC. So I got called down to the NASD at that time, they were referred to the NASD. You were going to be a target? They thought I was doing insider trading. Uh, so I actually went down to the NASD. Now, my lawyer is like, you got to go with me. You got to go with me. And I was like, no. And of course, that was the right advice. But I walked down there <laughs> and I walked into the office and I said, let me show you how I'm doing this. I got nothing Using to logic, right? <laughs> this is how I came with this one. This is how I came. And I just reasoned with these people. And it worked. I was there for like three hours. They asked me every question in the world. I felt like Neo from the Matrix. You know, I knew my shit. That's I knew great. my shit. Well, yeah. yeah. Later in life, I'm I'm sure you learn never go anywhere without. Right. You. I would have. I would have. If that happened today, I'd be with five lawyers. You know, <laughs> I'd be right. flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd bring Roy Cohn back from the dead. Listen, the uh, the government doesn't play to lose. 
That's right. But at that time, I was young. I still believed in the system, the purity of the system. You know, it was like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. If I go down there and reason and tell these men that I'm real, that I this kid from fucking Queens who grew up pot to piss in is actually sitting up at night researching these bank stocks, looking at their book value, their earnings in, in relation to book value, you know, all these things that I'm using blunt force logic and I'm picking these. I thought that argument would work. It happened to work that day. That's but amazing. I, did they, I mean, how much pushback did you get? Uh, you for the, well, it's like a fight. You know, uh, they hit me, I hit them harder. They hit me, I hit them even harder. And then they broke. That's great. Yeah, that was a good again, day for me. Usually they, they would come up with some horseshit reason why you're guilty. Yeah, I mean, at this time, they saw I was 25. I was a young kid, you know, and I'm sitting there talking and I'm and, I, you know, I go there alone. I guess that might have meant something, well, you know, yeah. you know, you know it meant yeah. something. Because if you went there with your actually, you were probably smart because if you went there with your attorney, you wouldn't have been allowed to say anything. That's right. Probably. Right. Um, and you would have been whatever. You would have yeah, found yeah, something. yeah, so I think yeah, I got lucky. So yeah, so takeovers were my thing. And I picked enough where a bunch of my clients, when I had the delusional idea to start a broker dealer, uh, market maker, uh, they bankrolled me, you know, and we made a market in 100 stocks and Lexington wow. Capital Partners was a name, we had to change it to LCP Capital after a while. And, um, you know, and, I, you know, we built a, a brokerage firm that had a nice trading desk, not big, you know, we had a $5 million ish box. So, you know, if you're making a hundred markets means you can't really make a hundred markets with only 5 million. But to me, I was really like excited and proud, you know, we're trading against Myerson and, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, all the, all the guys, you remember the box, you know, you what those trading boxes against Schoenfeld. Schoenfeld, a hundred percent. I was going to say Schoenfeld. Goldman. I remember seeing for the first time Goldman Sachs. I felt like I was part of a club. You yeah. know, I was like, wow. Yeah. And, you know, this is back when it's when we haven't gone to we're still dealing fractions. I so, know. you know, so also we have retail brokers and, you know, we're just, you know, whenever they want to come in and buy share, buy 10,000 shares of XYZ, we're just shorting them the stock and we're making money seven out of 10 times. Well, listen, I remember the day, you know, we had a they called the traders in at Schoenfeld and talked about how they were, you know, moving to pennies and how, no. oh, God. you know, the, the thinking was that that could destroy the market. Or the trading market, but like everything else, it didn't. No, it didn't. And I sold my business soon after that. This was a 99, 98, 99. I sold my business right after that. Right in uh, at the end of 99, I was negotiating the sale of it. And I got out right right in early 2000 before the Fed started raising rates. <laughs> before the, the tech bubble. Burst. Yeah, before it burst, before it burst. I like to say that I was a genius, but I just wanted to get out. I was burnt. The, the higher truth is I was just done. So do you remember what kind of multiple you got? Uh, on selling the bank? On yeah, my investment well, bank? Selling your, selling your I, 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 enough to, I hit a double. Okay. I didn't hit a home run. I had enough not to work for like 10, 12, 15, 20 years, depending on my spending level, but okay. not enough to, to retire. And what I did as soon as I did that is I thought, well, I made money here. Now I'm a genius. So of course, what did I do? I went and start bought into an internet company, started an internet company, got involved. So yeah, as clever as I look getting out at the top of the tech bubble, I go into an idea that I think I can make work because I'm special, right? that middle company almost put me into bankruptcy because I got my ego wrapped around it. You know, I stopped seeing the playing field objectively. Right. You know, I started to believe my own bullshit, frankly. Um, and, you know, yeah, that, that happens. I didn't know that could happen to me, but that happened to me. Well, so, you know, going back to the hypersonics, to the war games, to China, to national security, you know, what, what are you looking at now? So, um, so from, from my AI is changing warfare. Warfare is changing very, very quickly. They're calling it the fourth revolution in warfare. Um, and you think of the machine gun, they're not considering when they use this, is it machine gun, tanks, nukes, machine gun, planes, tanks, nukes. So this is the fourth AI is the fourth revolution in warfare. There's no doubt about it. So the speed, when the key about warfare from the beginning of time was to speed up the kill chain, you know, the kill chain, the process by which you identify, target, and kill the uh, the uh, opponent. 
Right. And back when Alexander Julius Caesar was running around R Gaul or Rome, the kill chain was: I see the soldier, opposing soldier, across the field. I, I walk up to him, I target him, I approach, and then I kill. Right? You know, swords. Then all of a sudden, bows and arrows. You know, identify. There he is over there. Target. Lift up my bow. Boop. Kill. Right. And Germany really jumped up the kill chain. You know, first, they, you know, machine gun, Churchill sped up the kill chain, moving tanks, you know, moving people and airplanes. But the real big move for kill chain happened. The speed happened in World War II. A lot of people think that Germany had a stronger army than France. It's actually not true. They were both very equally matched right to start World War II. The thing is that Germany introduced radios to all their tanks. So their tanks were able to act like swarms and share information. So they sped up their kill chain. The country with the fastest kill chain wins, period. So what we're doing now is if you think of a conflict in the South China Sea, Imagine China goes and surrounds the Philippines, Japan, or Taiwan, right? We send ships there. Now, China is smart. They're going to send 10,000 drones at us just to exhaust the bullets in our guns, our Navy guns. Think of the guns on the ship, right? You have a gunner going bang, 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 bang. The, the speed at which these drones are coming at you now is too fast for a human, right? That's number one. So what they need is they're adding AI to these so the AI can identify incoming drone, target them, and kill them. So everything is getting weaponized with AI to increase the speed. The second thing that's happening in warfare that's interesting is we're moving away in that China example. This, If the AI allows you to identify target faster, it can spot incoming faster. The killing portion of it, shooting the projectiles, we run out of them too quickly in a conflict, in a war game scenario with the South China Sea. So what they're now doing is they're actually moving laser weapons, Lockheed Mars, Martin, laser weapons onto these ships, which cost a fraction of actual projectile weapons and can really knock these drones out. What's interesting about Ukraine is all of this is being tested right now in Ukraine. All of it. You know, all of this, what's happening in Ukraine is they've taken a lot of these, well, a year ago, they were taking two years ago, they were taking all these Soviet weapons and adding software to them, you know, and it's speeding up the kill chain. The country with the fastest kill chain will be the next superpower. And how do you do that? You need chips. You need processors. This is why Trump block China, because China said, we want to be the dominant power. Well, we're not going to fight a war against our own ships. We're going to block you from getting ships. Biden, to his credit, nobody could take this away from him, increased that ban, rightfully so, when these new chips were made. They said, well, we're not let, letting you get these new NVIDIA chips either. We don't want to fight a war against our own ships, our own brains. So the, the battle now isn't even about the guns anymore. It's about the speed and the software, which is all about the chips. So, so that's what war is about. So China uh, is planning on invading or taking over Taiwan. And Taiwan, oh, for sure. yeah. do they provide the world with what percentage of our chips? 90% of advanced semiconductors come from Taiwan. So no, no, everything, your phone, if there was a war over Taiwan, I mean, you know, I, chips, all commerce would stop. All chips would shop, stop. You, this would triple. All phones, everything, this computer, Zoom, all of it would triple in price immediately. There would be an emergency. The U.S. military would have to actually stockpile the ones that have come in, the 30% and the 10% that we can still deal with. They would get commandeered by the, the U.S. military. I mean, these are the chips that make our F-35 fly. It's national security. So, you know. So if it's inevitable that China will do something with Taiwan, is the United States ready for that? And if not, no. how do you plan to profit? No, I mean, that sounds horrible, but you know, how do you plan to profit from that? So, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said, walk softly and carry a big stick. You know, Reagan says, peace through strength. So the plan here and Trump and Biden, Trump was pushing NATO to increase spending because he's saying, look, we've got to face China. We need you to cover your backyard. You got to pay for your own backyard. Sure. We've got to pivot to Asia. OK, so thankfully he did that. Biden has intelligently, again, another smart thing that they have been doing. And I'm not a Biden fan. 
but I'm just telling you what it is. Yeah. I'm calling balls and strikes on this. Absolutely. He got our allies to really focus. So the Philippines, Korea, Japan, we're all starting in India and Australia. We're all starting to dance together. We're doing all these exercises. So what we're trying to show China is don't attack because all of us are running all these military exercises here. We will stop you. You know, we're trying to intimidate them. When you think of birds, uh, apes in the wild, what do they do when they're trying to demonstrate? You know, they, they sit there and puff up and they run around. And they, 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 they. We're, that's what's happening right now. China is doing it to us. We're doing it to them. And the ape that d puts on the most dominant display so far has been us. But woof, you saw how China surrounded Taiwan when Pelosi went there. Very impressive. Well, you know what? I mean, my opinion is that we are not. Exist we're not enough strength that we're not we're, you know the uh, you know one one anecdote is the the china balloon that you know took a took a little break over <laughs> yeah. our yeah. silos and then you know i, I just yeah, it's don't crazy. understand but no it's crazy so, it's crazy but we're not ready for china attack on taiwan there's all the war game scenarios have us losing massive amounts of lives i mean it's a total disaster for us we need to build up there there's no mistake about it Right. No mistake about it. So we need we need we need increased defense spending. That's right. And what we're doing is at behind the markets is we've been focused on companies that are really at the cutting edge of speeding up the kill chain. You know, well, where are they helping speed up the kill chain, whether it's in drones, whether it's in the targeting, the AI that goes on the gun that really at like Palantir that targets and identifies and shoots, whether it's the, the laser system that goes in there for supply, you know, to replace the bullets. We're looking at companies that are at the cutting edge. And one good thing that I've seen recently, one glimmer of hope is, you know, these snot nosed little punks from Silicon Valley who were not supporting anything with defense in it. They didn't want anything to do with that we protest you know google and all these these kids um i've started to see some people like the guy who, who invented the oculus rift vr set he left facebook he starts a he, he sold his company oculus to facebook billions of dollars leaves facebook he starts a new defense company in long beach called anderil and they're getting contracts another guy just started from silicon valley another defense we can't win this war without silicon valley frankly on this a hundred percent. So we've run out of time, but if somebody wanted to learn more about you, about your behind the markets, about, you know, your, your stock picking prowess and stocks that you may or may not like now, how do they, how do they reach you, get in touch with you? Just go to behind the markets dot com behind the markets all one word dot com and there's a little contact us thing on the website it actually worked because i i put the customer service team through their paces like once every yes. couple of weeks i test that just to make sure that's there i might have gotten in touch with you through that yeah yeah exactly yeah so it does work it so does work give, give them a raise uh but, thank you very much mike but uh i would love to have more of a conversation i found this very uh engaging you know i love talking i love talking about this stuff so Me too. it was a pleasure. And Thank you. Seriously, I hope to have you join us again soon. Thank you, Mike. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. I'm grateful. You too. All right. Thank you for listening to Do You Ever Wonder? And we hope that you enjoyed the show. Next week, we will have another terrific guest telling their story. And if there are any specific topics you'd like to hear more about, please don't hesitate to let us know. Our curiosity, like yours, knows no bounds. Please subscribe and like and share this episode on your social media. See you next week.